listeners, readers, welcome back. We are diving into section two of our three-part lecture on Claire Keegan's unbelievably great foster. So I have so much to say, I'm gonna need to just dive straight on in here. So one of the things that I think the novel does best, although it's so funny, I didn't really think of it as a child narration, like ever, because it's so gripping and kind of haunting and interesting. In fact, I think I read that somewhere, um, you know, in, in some of my research I was doing, someone referred to it as a child narration and I was like, oh my God, right. It's, um, you know, it, it's sort of up there with like, you know, uh, To Kill a Mockingbird or Catcher in the Rye. Those are the sort of titles I think of when I think of child narration. Um, in, in my opinion, this actually does share quite a bit with Catcher, with uh, uh, To Kill a Mockingbird, but, but there's a creepiness and a, and a literary quality here that I found just absolutely riveting. Okay, so one of the things today that we're going to discuss, we're going to sort of dive into two main things. One is the narrative voice and this this child narrative and how uh, Keegan uses it so deftly to create this mystery and this tension and this kind of suspicion that really keeps the reader turning the pages. OK, we're, and then uh, then we're going to talk a little bit further about the mystery and about how she kind of fosters this mystery um, and also about my uh, naivete as a reader there were one or two parts where i was like i don't know how i was not reading these signals better but I, it was funny um we'll get there okay uh we're gonna look at pages three and four just to dive in a little bit more deeply into this child narrator but also into the absolute mastery of the prose here down at the very bottom of three in the yard tall shiny panes reflect our coming I see myself looking out from the back seat, wild as a gypsy child with my hair all loose, but my father at the wheel looks just like my father. A big loose hound whose coat is littered with the shadows of the trees lets out a few rough half-hearted barks, then sits on the step and looks back at the doorway where the man has come out to stand. He has a square body like the men my sisters sometimes draw but his eyebrows are white to match his hair. He looks nothing like my mother's people who are all tall with long arms. And I wonder if we have not come to the wrong house. There again, so much is happening here and it is all, it, you know, it, in my opinion, um, a lot of it is because of the, the sort of wonder and the observational, uh, skills of this child. I, there's a lot being made of, of this child as a, as a, um, as a, a victim of neglect. And I think that she's definitely a victim of neglect. Um, and there's some questioning in different articles about whether or not there's actual abuse happening. Um, the other novel, the one that I can never remember the name of, the one called Small Things Like These, that one, you know, it speaks more directly to abuse of children. But in this case, I think you can argue a couple of different ways, and I'm not sure that we are meant to know one way or the other. But this child is so observant and so concerned with secrets that you do wonder, in fact, if this is a child who um, has seen some difficult things. Also, very importantly, um, you know, this is 1981 in Ireland. Um, you know, I think everyone in the country had seen some really gnarly things. It, it, you know, you're in the heart of the Troubles, which began in 1969. Incredible sectarian violence throughout the entire country and the threat of, you know, bombs and you have strikers, hunger strikers who are dying and you have, um, you know, neighbors against neighbors. So it, it's a country that's that's very internally torn um, you know, by essentially what is a civil war. So this is a child who is very observant in, in a country that is really in a lot of turmoil. And you can see that in the prose. Okay, so it's so beautiful that she sees herself um, and she's a wild gypsy child with my hair loose. So again, this hair is very important. Um, it's about to be washed in, in, in a sort of um, baptismal scene by her new uh, mother figure. But it's important too that her father is still at the wheel because there is this sense of her father as, as about to escape again, but also as her father being at the wheel, her father being in control of everything. 
Um, and then very importantly, a big loose hound with this coat um, is, is uh, littered with the shadows of the trees. So we are associating this, this hound with the shadows. Turns out this hound is responsible for the death of the child. And um, that's the big, huge spoiler of, of this episode. So we don't know that until the middle of the book. And yet when you go back and reread, and this is a book that definitely rewards rereading, we know here that this this hound is very much meant, it's very associated with, with the shadows. Later, we're going to see dogs that are black. All the dogs are barking. All of the dogs are sort of menacing. And this dog here, a few rough, half-hearted barks, it is very significant because this is a dog, you know, who almost lost its life and then sweet Dan was not able to shoot it. Um, you have a sense of this dog as really having also been through a lot. Um, okay, so then the man appears and this is important. He has a square body like the men my sisters sometimes draw. So this this square body that he has, it's very much like the house. It's, it's, um, I don't know that we're meant to make a lot of him yet. He's a bit of a mystery. But then now having read the whole book, there is a solidity to him. There is a, um, a, a sense of, of him as being very present and being a support for her. There's the part when the, the coffin is there and she's sitting on his lap and he is very much a support for her. And she puts his head, her head on his um, chest and he's very happy having her on his lap, which made me very suspicious which is, I mean, that is just a sign of the times. And it is also a sign of the way that uh, Claire Keegan is so good at ratcheting up this tension. But once we've read the book, we can read it, in fact, as a sign of support. So he's this square man. But um, there's this idea here of uh, her sisters drawing those. So I am arguing a couple of articles I read. One said she was between the ages of seven and nine. One said an older child. I think she's getting closer to maybe like nine, 10, 11 because of this kind of thing. She's saying her sisters draw men like that with the blocky body, which sort of gives us a sense that she's older than they are. Um, and then this idea of his eyes, his eyebrows and his hair being white is very significant because the woman comes out and she has black hair like this child, um, but her hair is, is we find out later, is dyed. We find that both of um, the, the mother and the father of the young boy their hair went white as soon as he died. So again, this black and white, this idea of um, of, of this kind of um, things being black or white, in, in, in many regards, you know, they are kind of this black and white. Turns out they're both white at heart. They're both white haired. Um, but you have this idea of, of things as being one way until the child dies and then things being entirely different. But then also this idea of the secret. You have this idea of the woman dyeing her hair in a way that you know she's keeping secret the fact that her hair is totally white. Um, so then um, let's see. Oh, and then there's this question of of we never know really definitively if these people are her mom's brother, her mom's sister. We get the sense of the dark hair. Um, I, I believe she has dark hair. I think she says that. I might be just reading that into that. Um, you have this sense. I, I I don't know that we know, and I think that's part of the story. I mean, I think one of the the like sort of best things, one of the most um, applicable and and most um, helpful things I learned in graduate school is that if you are confused by something or if you can't quite remember a detail or if something seems overwhelming, the great example is all of the different um, people in A Hundred Years of Solitude are all named like everyone is Juan Buendia or Jose Arcadio. They're all mixed up. And if you can't keep them straight, that is because Gabriel Garcia Marquez wants you to have an element of confusion because they are all the same generation. They're all essentially the same man. In this book, it's it's we're never quite sure who these people are because the child herself isn't sure because the child herself is um, no one has ever made clear to her exactly who these people are. At a minimum, it's not a big deal. It's not a big plot point that one of them is the aunt or the uncle. So, so you have this sense of, of her as being, again, as of being divided from these people. Okay, um, we're gonna look at page 17 and 18 to continue with the way that this, um, you know, this child narrator who is so astute and in some ways so articulate. I mean, again, the language is very spare and stripped down but it's also very, very telling. Um, we're going to take a look at, uh, at at the bottom of page 17 and on to 18. Um, I think that's where we're looking. Oh, to, uh, yes, to look at some of the tension that is rising. 
Okay, so we're back to the hair. Uh, she laughs at this and brushes the knots out of my hair and turns quiet. The windows in this room are open and through these, I see a stretch of lawn, a vegetable garden, edible things growing in rows, red spiky dahlias, a crow with something in his beak, which he slowly breaks in two and eats one half and then the other. So this is a, whenever um, we come to a house in literature, you want to think about that house as being emblematic of um, or sort of telling or, or kind of a, a symbol of the state of the family. So in this house, there are lots and lots of open doors and windows, which I think is very interesting. It speaks to the permeability of the family, that it's not sort of closed down. And um, in, in that regard, it's not necessarily safe. You have a lot of kind of open um, windows to breezes, but there is a certain sort of openness that, that is very helpful because it's very cathartic for this young person. Um, her own home is very claustrophobic. It's very dark. There's lots of stuff in it. In this home, you know, she can see right through these windows. And it's this beautiful description of, um, you know, a stretch of lawn. Presumably it's well tended because she's calling it a lawn. Uh, a vegetable garden with edible things growing in rows. There's a sense of nurturing and a sense of order here that, that she's not telling us it. She's just describing what she's seeing and we are meant to see the order and the nurturing. Um, but then we have the red spiky dahlias. So you have a lot of green and then you have this spiky red. So dahlias are very large and very spiky, but the idea of spikiness, later we see some red hot pokers. Um, they're, all, they're sort of um, a, this incredible balance between nurturing ordered things and then spiky red things. So you have this kind of, um, you know, she's kind of lulled into this sense of nurturing and then sees things that are in fact literal red flags. So as the reader, if you're reading carefully, you are also seeing this balance and it's difficult to know if she is in a setting that is safe and nurturing or one that represents danger. Uh, then we have the crow, this black crow that breaks something in two and eats one half and then the other. I mean, talk about symbolism here. So we've got this sense and this child is observing this. You know, if, if it's eating one half than the other, is it, you know, that the first child is going to be eaten and the second child is going to be eaten? Is it that the couple is in danger? Um, it, it, there's a lot of sort of foreboding here. So then right after the, the crow that eats the two things, the first half and then the second half, the, the mother, Edna, says, come down to the well with me. Now? Does now not suit you? Something about the way she says this makes me wonder if it's something we are not supposed to do. Is this secret? What? I mean, am I not supposed to tell? She turns round to she turns me round to face her. I have not really looked into her eyes until now. Her eyes are dark blue, pebbled with other blues. There are no secrets in this house, do you hear? Yikes! I mean, this is like so just foreboding. So first of all, she's being driven deep into these woods. And then and then literally this new mother figure who's combing out her hair is saying, come down to the well with me. I mean, talk about fairy tales. Like this is just seems very, very dark. Um, it's, it's not even Jack and Jill. This is like, I don't know what, it's dark. Um, and then this idea of her saying, just the way that she's saying it, because the well is is loaded in some ways for this woman, it's not the well that the son drowns in. He drowns in the slurry pond, which is where um, a slurry pond is where all of the, the organic refuse and all the manure and all of the um, the stuff that a, that a farmer can't use goes into like a slurry tank. Uh, so, I mean, what a terrible place to drown that poor boy. Um, so, but something of the way, about the way she is saying this puts this child on high alert. And this is a child who is used to secrets. This is a child who is used to having things happen to her where she's not supposed to tell. So for me, again, I'm going back to this phallic symbol, symbol of the hat and the cigarette and whatnot, and, and the, the sort of yuck vibes that I get from the dad, um, this idea of, of her potentially as being a, a, a victim of some sort of abuse. Uh, but then there's this beautiful thing too, where we see into the eyes of this woman, but then this, this insistence that she has, there are no secrets in this house, do you hear? But she's lying. 
I mean, this woman who we eventually do trust and who is very trusting, she's literally lying. So we do have every, you know, our suspicion that she is lying is in fact very founded. There are huge secrets in this house. Okay, so, um, and, and in fact, um, I'm just very quickly, I didn't even have this in my notes, but I'm, I just turned right to it here. Um, right down at the end of this chapter, we're not gonna have time to talk about the chapter endings, but Claire Keegan is so good at them. She says, while the child, she thinks the child's sleeping, God help you, child, she whispers, if you were mine, I'd never leave you in a house with strangers. Oh my God. So in that case, like it's both, again, this is that flip thing where it's both good and evil altogether. You can read that as like a condemnation of her mother. Like I would never send this gorgeous, like this beautiful, innocent child to, to stay with strangers, but also you're like, yikes, she could be creepy stranger. Like she could be like, I would never send you to me. So you have this incredible, again, this bivalence that's just absolutely uh, masterful. Also, everything, all of the symbols, you know, we have this nice vegetable garden and then the red spiky dahlias. The things that we have um, sort of seen and heard up until now, we have the rhubarb, which is a poisonous plant. Um, we have knives. The woman is always wielding this big knife. We have chainsaws in the distance, which also help us place this in time. It's again, 1981. Um, we have electric fences, you know, when they're gonna be walking to the well soon, they're walking by and she's saying, you know, be, be very aware of the fences or you'll get a shock. I mean, this is like, oh my God, this is, this is not a place that seems nurturing. Uh, and yet in fact, it, it, it is exactly that. We're now gonna go to page 22 to take another look at this child narrator and how, um, how deftly we are, we are given these signals about both the danger and the potential nurturing in this family. So on 22, they go to the well. Oh, and I, um, I don't know about you, but I was picturing like a well, like literally a Jack and Jill, kind of like a wishing well with a high wall where you would drop a bucket down um, on like some sort of a string. And I um, have an image of this that you can look at if you want to check out the YouTube channel. But these Irish wells are sort of like a, um, there's lots of stone around them and they're these big spaces, almost like a small amphitheater. And you walk down the steps and then the well is just like this big open kind of pond. It's like a man-made round pond, but you do go down some steps. I was having a hard time picturing her walking down into a wishing well, because in fact, you cannot do that. Okay. So um, on 22, she's at the well. I dip the ladle and bring it to my lips. The water is cool and clean as anything I have ever tasted. It tastes of my father leaving, of him never having been there, of having nothing after he was gone. I dip it again and lift it level with the sunlight. I drink six measures of water and wish for now that this place without shame or secrets could be my home. Then the woman pulls me back to where I am safe on the grass and goes down alone. I mean, what a beautiful, beautiful and like really significant paragraph. So again, um, this is the, the dad not coming out well here. I mean, you can, again, all of this stuff can be read in, in sort of one tone or another. It tastes of her father leaving, of him never having been there. Um, again, here we have this father figure who can, this can be read both as her being abandoned by him as if he were never there. Uh, I think when we finish the novel and we go back and look at this, it's even a little more insidious than you might also read it. I think there is a sense of her um, being happy. I mean, this is a this is a, a, an idea of renewal and rebirth and cleansing here at this well. She's drinking, I don't know why she's drinking six ladles full, um, I should probably do a little more research into that. I love the idea of the light. She's bringing it to the light and it's almost as if she's drinking in the light. Again, this lightness and this darkness. Um, and, and she really is sort of sucked into this idea of this house already as being a place with no shame and no secrets, which to my mind uh, is saying that in fact, her house is a place of shame and secrets. And then she is pulled back to safety by this woman who, this is page 22, the entire novel is what, 90, 
99 pages long. So we're a quarter of the way through and we're getting more and more of a sense of this woman as in fact being nurturing and being caring. So she pulls her back to safety and then the woman herself goes down to gather more water. So you, you have, uh, this is just very good examples of the way a child can explain something in very childlike terms and it, it doesn't feel forced. It doesn't feel um, you know, heavy handed, but it is so incredibly multivalent and so impactful. Okay, so um, it's also one of the reasons why I think she's maybe a little bit older. I mean, she's at one point she talks about uh, when she's fantasizing about what the house will be like, she talks about lying um, in, a, in a room with lots of other girls telling secrets that they wouldn't tell the next day. So there's this sense of her as being sort of on the cusp of, of not adulthood necessarily, but on, on sort of the, the cusp of, of teenhood. Um, and actually, I don't have a place in the lecture to talk about it, so I'll just dip in right now. Speaking of dipping a ladle, um, there is that part where when she wakes up and the and the mattress, the the um, Edna has a very strong reaction to the mattress and says the mattress is weeping. Um, I at first thought she got her period. So there also is this idea that her mother told her she needed to change her pants every day. So pants in um, in Irish in Ireland um, are, are underwear. And um, I think trousers is is what she calls like her pant pants. So this idea of needing to change her underwear a lot, this there's a lot of sort of attention paid to that. And then the the Edna has such a strong reaction. Um, I think you know they take the mattress down and they have it out and they in the in the um, in the sunshine and whatnot. So I'm not sure you would do that if there's like a big menstrual stain there. But there is, and I, I don't necessarily think she's menstruating, but I do think there's this idea. That, that this is something that might happen. And, you know, you can have a period when you're nine years old. So I think, you know, she's in that zone, certainly. But I think there is, um, we are meant to believe that she's sort of on the cusp of more than, um, than, and a lot of the times when she's aligned with heifers, this idea of young fertile calves, um, you know, cow, female, cows there's this idea of fecundity and this idea of, of um, you know, of, of uh, procreation. Uh, okay, but I want to go on a little bit further about um, the mystery that we are getting that we're setting up so deftly. So we're going to go back to page 17. And this is this kind of like taught uh, narrative. You know, there's the, the language is very spare, but and it's it, again, very short, but a lot of tension is built up through the entire, um, really through the entire thing. Once we've solved the mystery of the child, there is still this mystery of, you know, does she get to stay? Is, um, you know, is her foster father a terrible dude? Is her dad a terrible dude? You know, there, there are several mysteries that remain. Um, this is the part in the lecture where I'm going to talk about my naivete. So um, when on page 17 here, this is the part where she gets the new clothing for the girl. She takes me to another bedroom past theirs at the other side of the stairs and looks through a chest of drawers. Maybe these will fit you. She is holding a pair of old fashioned trousers and a new plaid shirt. The sleeves and legs are too long, but she rolls them up and tightens the waist with a canvas belt to fit me. There now, she says. Mammy says I have to change my pants every day. And what else does your mammy say? She says you can keep me for as long as you like. So sad. So she laughs at that, Edna laughs at that. I mean, it is so heartrending, this book. Um, and, and that's the kind of thing that a child would say, you know, she, and she's saying it because her mother literally said those words. She overheard her parents talking and he says, what am I going to tell them? And she, the mom says, you know, you can basically tell them they can have her forever, which is so awful. But here we have her being outfitted into these clothes. And my marginalia here literally says, whose clothes? with like an exclamation mark and a question mark, which is so naive. I mean, obviously these are the clothes of a dead child, obviously. I mean, I think I must have known that. I think I just didn't like really clue in to what exactly we were. They're old fashioned trousers. So we are also meant to believe that Dan and Edna, you know, this was quite a while ago because there's there's this sense of, of enough time having passed for them to have, I mean, it's not a brand new kind of grief, um, but again, it, it, it puts a little space, this old fashioned trousers. Um, although it's a new plaid shirt, I'm not sure what we make of that. Um, okay. So that was, you know, number one of the mystery. And then number two on page 24, 
I mean, you guys, I couldn't believe that this like was even remotely a surprise to me. So on 24 here, um, the our, our, our main narrator, by the way, we don't have a name for the main narrator. I should have, um, I should have remarked on that last time. Uh, she is nameless, which I love. I love a nameless main character. Partially, I love it because it's not, um, it, it, you know, it doesn't sort of make her, like if her name were Karen, no offense to all you Karens out there. Actually, I know so many Karens and I love them all. Let me think of a new one. Her name is not um, Jerusha. Okay. So there's not, it's not like, you know, we don't have some yucky name to overcome, but I also love the fact that she doesn't have a name because she's kind of not come into her own. She doesn't know who she is. We are not her, sure who she is. So you have this sense of her as, as being nameless because she is so young. Um, at one point he, he twice, he refers to her as pedal, which both times I wrote you in my margins because it seemed kind of gross to me. Like it seemed kind of ick and yuck. And like he was being like the idea of a petal opening. And there was something kind of like labia-ish about petal. Like I just was like, ew, I don't think I like that. In one of the reviews I read, the person thought her name was petal and they kept calling her that. But if her name were petal, um, it would be capitalized. And when he calls her that, it is definitively not capitalized. I didn't even go back and look at it, but I was basically like, what a dumbass reviewer. Her name is not petal. Okay, so um, right here on page 24, she is going to bed and Edna is tucking her in. She leans over me then and kisses me, a plain kiss. Yikes. I mean, that again, there's another little little evidence, a little more fodder for my suspicion that in fact, this is a child who has secrets that she is keeping and says good night. I sit up when she is gone and look around the room. Trains of every color race across the wallpaper. There are no tracks for these trains, but here and there a small boy stands off in the distance waving. He looks happy, but some part of me feels sorry for every version of him. Oh my God. I mean, okay, the crazy thing here is that in my naivete, I totally didn't get this. I didn't automatically be like, oh my God, they lost a son. Like it just didn't, I don't know why that didn't occur to me. Probably because I was so impressed by these trackless trains. So the trains are racing. So one of the things that she does is race. She's racing, the birds are racing. There's this idea of being, um, she's fast, she has long legs, she can run. Um, there's this idea of her being capable of escape, which is very important um, in many different times of the, of, the, uh, of the novel. But this idea of these trains racing in all directions, but not on tracks. There's this idea of, of um, you know, things not being predetermined and things being um, out of control and things moving too fast. And then the small boy, and not only is he standing there, but he's waving. Oh my God. And this idea that he looks happy, but some part of her uh, feels sorry for every version of him. So, I mean, wow. Like it is, you you could think it's heavy handed. Like when I read back over it, I'm like, this should be heavy handed. And yet I didn't know. I, in fact, I was so naive. This is the last thing we're going to look at on pages 56 and 57. Oh my Lord, you guys. Okay. So up here, she's walking home from the wake where she's sitting on um, Dan's lap the whole time, which made me really nervous. Um, so up at the top here, the woman that she's walking home with, who's bringing her home to play with her children, says something about the tragedy. And then our unnamed narrator says, what do you mean? The Kinsella's young lad, you dope. Did you not know? I don't know what to say. That must have been some stone they rolled back to find you. Sure, didn't he follow that old hound of theirs into the slurry tank and drown? I literally was like, oh my God, actually the thing that I wrote in the <laughs> my marginalia was Lazarus because this idea of rolling back the stone, you know, it's this idea of, um, of, of uh, you know, that like a, like a rebirth, you know, um, but there's this idea here of, um, of, of like also, of course, like, like living under a rock, like if you've been living under a rock, they had to overturn a stone to find this young girl who hadn't heard about the tragedy of the boy. Um, and so, and then of course we find out that it's the hound. What's incredible here is kind of this like blase off the cuff way that this woman delivers this information. And also it's such a, um, such a shock because it's so complete in its story-ness. Like when she says, didn't he follow that old hound of theirs? I love the Irish intonation here. Sure, didn't he follow the old hound of theirs into the slurry tank 
and drown. So he's following the hound into the slurry tank. And he, I mean, I guess maybe the dog went in first and he went in to save the dog. I'm not exactly sure what's happening. Um, also, slurry tanks are very dangerous, apparently, because they give off a lot of um, like toxic fumes. <laughs> I just don't know what the, I mean, maybe, you know, dogs love that kind of stuff, but they give off a lot of toxic fumes that can actually like make you feel woozy. So who knows what exactly happened? Again, another mystery, but you have this entire story here that is so tragic. The kid drowns, it's in a gross slurry tank and also that it involves the dog, which is just heartbreaking. Um, and then um, let's see, I wanted to go down to part B here over across the way. This is more about the mystery. And you know the pair of them turned white overnight. What do you mean? Their hair, what else? But Mrs. Kinsella's hair is black. Black? Aye, black out of the dye pot, you mean, she laughs. I wonder at her laughing like this. I wonder at the clothes and how I'd worn them and how the boy in the wallpaper and how I'd never put it all together. And I wrote, the reader didn't either, which I don't know, maybe you guys didn't see it either, but I like, I in retrospect, it seems so obvious to me. Soon we came to the place where the black dog is barking through, sorry, soon we come to the place where the black dog is barking through the bars of the gate. Shut up and get in, you, she says to him. It's a cottage she lives in with uneven slabs of concrete outside the front door, overgrown shrubs and tall, hot red pokers growing out of the ground. Here, I must watch my head my step. So we have her entering a different home. Again, this idea of having to watch her head makes me think that she's quite tall, um, unless she means she has to like keep control of her head, but she's a young enough child and the prose is so straightforward. There's almost no metaphorical, I mean, there's tons of metaphorical stuff and, and, and figurative language in our interpretation, but it's not, the child is not meaning for us to interpret these things in those ways. Um, so this idea of, of, again, these red hot pokers that are, and the concrete slabs, and the idea of having to watch her head and watch her step, um, all of these things, I think she means literally, and yet again, we have this sense of real threat, not to mention the dog, the black dog uh, barking at the gate. Okay. So, um, and, and here we have this black and white, the black and white image is continuing. So here, we page 56, the mystery is solved for us, you know, one of the mysteries. But again, you have these continuing mysteries, this idea of um, what, you know, what kind of secrets do we have at home? What kind of secrets do we have in the house where she is now? And we, again, are pretty suspicious still. Um, I'm very suspicious of John, but I'm also suspicious of Dan like how he's making her run all the time. I was like, maybe at some point she has to run away from Dan. You know, it's like a John Irving thing where they're always practicing the thing that at the climax of the novel is what saves everybody. Um, but there's also, um, you know, all the suspicion of her own parents. So we have kind of resolution of one mystery and yet it kind of proliferates into all of these other mysteries. So, Wow. Um, I am just really loving this book and I'm loving talking to you about it. So please join us for the third chunk of this lecture on Claire Keegan's Amazing Foster, where we will talk more about figurative language and then the close of the novel.